including head injury. And so Andrew makes us his focus not only looking after those critically ill patients, uh, but also he is a world acclaimed scientist in understanding a head injury, its diagnosis, and its treatment. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome Andrew to the podium, uh, and we all look forward to his talk, and uh, this is an open forum. So if you have questions for Andrew, he'll be more than happy to answer them for you. So, Andrew? Thanks a lot. So, uh, thanks for inviting me. We're going to talk about uh, brain injuries, <clears throat> and uh, in a very general way, the brain can be injured by a whole bunch of ways, diseases and stroke and so on. So we're going to talk about traumatic brain injuries. And trauma to us means anything that really uh, results in the transfer of physical energy. So it's not trauma in the psychological sense, trauma in the banging your head sense. And, um, and this is the brain. And uh, many people feel this is a uh, relatively important organ. And uh, it is probably that because um, the brainstem helps coordinate vital functions, like the uh, breathing and the heart, which keeps us alive. Uh, the brain activity coordinates nutritional and reproductive activities, reproductive behavior, keeps our species going. And of course, there's consciousness. You may not know there's 100 billion neurons in the brain, and those represent only 50% of the types of cells we have in our brain. There's all sorts of other different types of cells. And each neuron has maybe between 100 up to 200,000 connections. The brain is only 2% of our body weight, but gets 15 to 20% of our blood flow because of all the things that it does. One of the things that fascinates me about the brain is the time constants of change are extremely short. And that's both on the function side and the vulnerability side. And what I mean by that is that when our bones function, they function with, you know, over minutes, hours, days, years, and even fine dinosaur bones. Our brain functionality, in terms of their strength and so on, that's one end of the spectrum. Our brain, uh, its function really is happening in microseconds. And its vulnerability is equally amongst the shortest in the body. It really is the shortest in the body. Five to 10 seconds without brain blood flow, and we lose consciousness. Three minutes, we start to die. And so we have looked at the brain in detail. We give all different parts of the brain different names because uh, we want to sort of understand its function. Once we understand the function, then it has to send all the signals out to the body and carry out all its desires. But looking more closely, I remember my dad used to tell me to use my gray matter. And that is because that around the, uh, the cortex or the surface, of the brain is what we call the gray matter because it appears more gray than the central white matter. And the gray matter is where all the neurons with short axons are with multiple connections and that are responsible for specific tasks. Specific tasks like motor, moving a thumb, moving an arm or a leg, sensation, specific thoughts and memories. The white matter here is what connects up all our gray matter. So it's where long, insulated axons go from one part of the brain to the other. And this is the corpus callosum here, and it connects the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain. So I told you we'd be talking about <coughs> excuse me, trauma today. So if you have to drive up to 400 today or this winter, you may have seen something like this uh, this winter. What happens when somebody's in an accident like this? Or what happens if you take up a sport like this? This is actually a picture of me, and that's my sister off to the back, off to the side. <laughs> you can actually see. Uh, or if you're unlucky enough to get a bullet through the brain, what happens in a situation like this? Unfortunately, we see these cases, and as you can see, this is a pathological or an autopsy specimen. Bullet uh, wounds that go through the midline or the center of the brain are particularly fatal. Uh, this is an autopsy as well. This is an ice pick. But it's just on one side of the brain, this can be survivable. But through the midline, it's usually fatal. So this is the sort of trauma that we're dealing with here at St. Michael's Hospital. And I want to talk to you about how we deal with that sort of situation, given the relative importance of the brain and its sensitivity and vulnerability. So what happens when you bang your head, for example, on the windshield? Well, your brain is sort of the, the consistency of well-cooked cauliflower or firm jello. It's not liquid, but it's not solid. 
It sort of jostles around inside your skull. And as you go forwards and hit your head on the windshield, the brain will continue forwards uh, because it's got that inertia. It doesn't stop with the skull. And I just want to emphasize that here. As you see, when the brain is going, uh, when the head is going forwards here, uh, the brain will uh, have inertia and actually uh, be pushed and get a bruise at the back until it hits the front, and then the brain will catch up and the uh, front of the brain will get injured. And I'll show you what I mean by that here. So sometimes you can, what we have is a, what's called a coup injury, so the force is here, and that's where the contusions are. A contra-coup injury is when, you, when the back of the head is hit, the brain goes forward and gets a bruise on the other side. You may remember, uh, some of you may remember the old stubby beer bottles. Um, they, they may have brought them back in. But you can do a party trick to demonstrate this <coughs> phenomenon. And that is you fill up a beer bottle with water and you put your finger in to occlude the hole. And, and then you sort of pull the, your finger out like that. And what that will do is pull the water upwards, much like the brain coming upwards towards the front of the skull, and create a vacuum at the bottom. And as you release the vacuum, the water will come back with such a force as knock a clear disc off the bottom of the bottle. So be careful a little bit. But I've done that at a party, and it, and it does knock a disc off the bottom. And this is what happens to the brain when you hit forwards. Your brain goes forward and snaps back. And so you get both a, a coup injury and a contra-coup injury as the, as the brain snaps back. And so and these are other examples, diagrams of how that happens. Bleeding can ensue, so you can tear the bridging veins that go from the surface of the brain to the skull. And this is, a, this is an autopsy view of a subdural hematoma. And so what happens when you arrive with one of these things to St. Michael's Hospital? The Hospital Volunteer Association kindly helped us put together this helipad on the top of uh, St. Mike's. So we now get those sorts of crash victims brought right here with that process, those contusions, that bleeding going on inside the head. So what we worry about is the following thing. We worry about those hematomas expanding, that blood expanding inside the head. And when it expands, it pushes down on the brainstem onto the vital areas of the brain. And, and as physicians and nurses in the hospital, primarily when we're sort of thinking about saving a life, we're worried about this phenomenon in the first couple of hours. And if we're not successful, another autopsy specimen, you can see the bleeding that will go on inside the brainstem, which is where your vital centers are, controlling your heart rate and your breathing. And this is why people die. So good news and bad news about the brain is that it's inside its own helmet. It has a skull. And when you injure your knee, it swells up. When you injure your abdomen, it swells up. When you injure your brain, it swells. But the trouble is, it has no place to go. And so the pressure builds up. And so as you increase the intracranial volume here with extra blood or a bullet or something, um, there will be compensation. So it is possible to go bungee jumping or stand on your head and do things like that where you increase the amount of blood in your head, in your veins. Because other things will compensate. The spinal fluid will decrease. Other blood volumes will decrease. But you'll reach a point where there's no more compensation available, and the pressure will shoot up. That's what we worry about when people bleed into their brain with one of these bruises. And when the pressure shoots up, it will cut off its own blood supply. And that's when people die. So there is one way to die, and that is with no blood flow to the brain. We used to think when your heart stopped, you, you died. We know that's not the case anymore. We only diagnose death in one way, and that is no blood flow to the brain. And that occurs in two ways. Either your heart stops, and there's no blood flow to the brain, or the pressure builds up in your, inside your skull so high that it cuts off its own blood supply. And that's the, and that's the way many people die after a head injury. I just took a photograph of this from my computer um, this morning, actually, because these are two cases I was in the IC last week. And ironically, I think um, this is a 32-year-old man, and this is a 43-year-old man. And um, so aside from using medicines that increase the osmolarity of the blood and suck water out of the brain, 
in order to decrease that swelling, you have to buy us time. Sometimes the pressure is so high that we have to, in a very urgent way, cut the skull off. You can see the skull has been cut off here. In order to take away nature's helmet and allow the brain to swell, because we don't want it to cut off its own uh, blood supply. So we did that twice last week. 30 year old guy, 43 year old guy. Both had accidents. And they both were going to die in the first two hours because of brain swelling. So we had to cut their. Uh, and, and the idea is that over the, the subsequent two or three weeks, the swelling will go down. And maybe about a month or six weeks later, we'll take that piece of skull and put it back on. So that's the sort of thing that we, we think about. And really, in terms of clinical research, and I, I know Ori talked to you last month about uh, resuscitation type research, <coughs> over the last 30 or 40 years in the world of head injury research, this is the sort of research that we've been doing on how to do this, when to do this, uh, why to do this, what's the physiology, and we've made tremendous progress. And that's been the, 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 um, the majority of what we've been studying over the last 20 years, the physiology of uh, severe traumatic brain injury. I want to talk to you a little bit about how and what, uh, uh, how important it is. Um, so we call, we talk about traumatic brain injury, uh, uh, and if you look at the age group here, and this is the rate of cases, the rate of deaths per 100,000 population. And so we're, at various age groups, the deaths from injury, any type of injury, are up around sort of uh, 75, and then exceeding 100 to 150 per 100,000, which is a huge number compared to other diseases. Um, and that from traumatic brain injury is also very, a very high component of that. And again, just another graph, different population. You can see here that when uh, people start to get active in their late teens and 20s, start to drive, males are at greater risk than females. The rate per 100,000 of death is huge huge. In fact, if you put it all together, the rate of traumatic brain injury uh, per year is much higher, even higher than these things put together. If you do the arithmetic, traumatic brain injury is the largest cause of potential years of life lost. Meaning when a 20-year-old dies of traumatic brain injury, they've lost potentially 60 years of life. When I die of a heart attack at 93, skiing a double black diamond, <laughs> that death will be attributed to heart disease, but the impact on society will be much less than 60 years of a productive 20 year old. Um, and so we divide our thinking about a traumatic brain injury in different categories. There, of course, I've been talking to you about severe traumatic brain injury people who arrive in a coma and who may die in the first two hours, 24 hours, or 48 hours. There's moderate TBI, people who are very confused and have smaller bruises, and we're very worried about how to treat those people and how to monitor those people because those bruises may get worse. You know, when you injure your knee one day, sometimes it's worse the next day. And so people who come in with moderate injuries, we're actually quite nervous about what, what, when that swelling may occur. And then there's a huge group of people that are referred to as having a mild TBI, sometimes in the, in the same sort of range or a scale of things that uh, some people refer to as concussion. The trouble with um, each of these, they each have their challenges. So in terms of success rate treating severe TBI, the mortality rate is still 40%. And only 10 to 15% of people with severe TBI, people who arrive in a severe coma, get back to their, to an independent life, not necessarily even their own life. So only 15% of people that arrive with that only get, get back to an independent life. And while we've made great progress in the last 20 years, <coughs> learning how to cut the skull off, treat the blood pressure, use osmolarity to shrink, uh, shrink the swelling, we still have a mortality of 40%. In the mild TBI world, there's a potential for greater success but we're still stuck with the following problem. 10 to 15% of people who have a concussion, the year later will still have symptoms. Headache, lack of concentration, fatigue, not themselves, not able to function at work as well as they, uh, they used to. And that's called post-concussion <coughs> syndrome. 
So we really have a big problem here because there's such a huge volume of people that have a concussion. And 10% is a small number, but 10% of a large number is still a very large number. And that's why it has such an impact on society. We probably all know somebody who's had concussions and who has the post-concussion syndrome and uh, has difficulty with memory and concentration. Brain injuries are complex. This is a uh, picture from our lab, actually, of the cerebellum. And this is a control, and you can see that we've stained Purkinje cells. You've probably learned about those in the cerebellum, and interneurons. And we, this was a fascinating experiment where we injured a rat up in the front of the brain and looked at the impact in the cerebellum. We won't talk all about that today, but you can see the interneurons <coughs> survived and the Purkinje cells did not. Fascinating, really, because it means that when we injure our brain in this mild sort of way, that different brain cells, different important brain cells, have different vulnerabilities. Starting to give us a clue that maybe what we've been thinking about for the last 20 years, which is pressure and blood flow, may not be the whole story. The story probably includes understanding the physiology of individual cells and why they have different vulnerabilities. And this, this slide is really meant to pique your curiosity. Why is it that some cells will die and others won't? There's lots of cells, and this is just a cartoon, uh, lots of important cells. So not only are there axons that we all sort of think about, but there's uh, oligodendrocytes, which help our uh, um, uh, neurons uh, survive. There's um, uh, astrocytes, which surround the blood vessels, which really take glucose and oxygen from the capillaries and deliver nutrients to the neuron. Many people think that neurons are dependent on glucose. It's actually, they're dependent on glucose because the astrocytes take up the glucose, turn it into lactate, and give the lactate to the neuron to uh, metabolize. And then, of course, there's the endothelial cells in the blood brain barrier. And really, we separate out these cells because that's the way we're used to thinking. But more and more, we're thinking of this whole thing as one unit. And we're trying to study what happens to this whole interdependent unit when it gets injured. And I'll tell you more about that. And here's another diagram of all the variety of things that happen. So it's taking us from the level of just thinking about blood flow and, and pressure inside the head, taking up the skull, to all the different metabolic processes that happen. For example, microglia, which are inflammatory cells. Already, I think, talked to you about those last month. Swelling of the astrocytes. Glutamate release, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, which causes sodium and then calcium to enter the cell of the neuron, and that calcium will then uh, in turn, turn uh, injure the mitochondria, turn on enzymes, which then go on to sort of digest the skeleton of the axon and impair the functioning of the axon. So let's go back to this picture. Um, in our lab, we were fascinated by thinking about this picture because in the clinic, we found that they were young people that had these big bruises, we took off the skull, and they woke up, and they did relatively well, despite what I was telling you. And the people that didn't do well in the ICU were people that injured their white matter. And this is in sharp contrast to the impression my father left with me, which was that all money was in the gray matter. When we worked in the units, we realized that if the people that don't wake up are the ones that have injured white matter. So Martin and I got interested in white matter and uh, how it got injured and why it was important. So let's go back to the mechanism of injury. If you take a bowl of jello and you put lines in it and you twist it, this sort of phenomenon will happen. And you'll get various, the various layers at different circumferences accelerating and decelerating at different levels. It's these long white matter tracks, these long axons, which will go from one la layer to the next which get sheer injury in this, in this uh, situation. I'm sorry about this diagram. Didn't come out very well. But um, so that when you rotate your head this way, not only do you get different angular momentum, and so the different layers of the brain will shear, but you actually get stretch of the neurons that are going in this direction from the centrifugal force. So just to give you a better diagram of that. So this is, uh, in the lab, you can take an individual axon like this. And this axon has been stretched. Not stretched so much that it will break, but just stretched about 10 to 15%. Didn't break. 
48 hours later, it broke. So this was another clue for us. It's not just the stretch and the break of the shear injury that happens at the time of the accident. We are seeing patients in whom they get some sort of concussion at time zero, and 48 hours later, the axon is breaking. This sounds to us more like something cellular, physiologic is going on than strictly mechanical breaking this, this axon. So uh, this, again, a pathological, unfortunate uh, autopsy situation of somebody who did suffer <coughs> from what we call diffuse axonal injury and not uncontrolled raised intracranial pressure. And you can see all the sort of small hemorrhages throughout the white, white matter. And this patient did very poorly and ended up dying. And just to emphasize the different layers, you can see a big hemorrhage between the gray matter section and the white matter section. Because they're slightly different densities, because of rotational sort of forces, the two layers will decelerate at different rates and leave a hemorrhage in between the two layers. This is the, where the left brain connects to the right brain I told you about. This is the corpus callosum. This is a big bruise in all of those axons. You can imagine the impact that has on coordinating your thinking. It's one thing to have your gray matter all intact, but have it not to be connected to each other is a big issue. In fact, many people would say that intelligence is the ability to connect apparently unrelated things. Right? And as, we, as a baby cries when its mother, its mother leaves the room, it, it begins to understand that its, mo its mother hasn't disappeared, and so it stops crying. And so it can relate. It can still connect an empty room to the ongoing existence of its mother. And as we get older and older, our intelligence is all about connecting apparently unrelated things. And really, in the same sort of way, the white matter is doing that for our gray matter. So a very important part. So when we look at, um, we now have very fancy MRI um, uh, machines that help us uh, look in detail at the tracks, the white matter tracks. And one of the techniques, techniques uh, MRI uses is to look at the diffusion of water. And so, not all the way down the track, but it can add up all the different diffusion directions that water molecules go in, calculates that, summarizes that, and develops a picture of tracks so that, so that water can diffuse in all directions, but it's most likely going to diffuse along a track of an axon or a set of axons. We do these images of people who've just had a concussion, and we're starting to learn, yep, there is a problem in white matter of people who've had concussions. This is what we're finding. Uh, and in fact, the human, human Connectome Project has taken this whole thing one step further. So that if this brain has been carefully dissected out to look at anatomical tracts of white matter, and in fact you can do this tractography with MRI and the diffusion, water diffusion uh, technique to look at common pathways of white matter, but we're now able to image when people start thinking about certain groups of thoughts or specific thoughts, I'm thinking about playing tennis. I have pain, I am sad, a variety of things, and start to map out what is referred to now as a connectome, which is not just anatomic pathways, but where are your thought pathways? And this is all dependent on healthy white matter. And so different maps like this are created. And the way I think of this is that, um, you know, it's okay to have a bunch of thoughts in your gray matter, Gray matter is what gets injured in a stroke. But unless it's connected up properly uh, with white matter, it's not going to really uh, function that well. And I mentioned consciousness, you know, and white matter may be sort of create that hologram of consciousness that if you have enough of these thoughts, if they are coordinated in the right way, bam, out pops a hologram of consciousness. Once the white matter starts to be picked away with multiple concussions, then this picture starts to get confused, more and more confused and you lose it. So that's what fascinated us. So there's 52,000 deaths from severe traumatic brain injury, 275 uh, hospitalizations from severe and moderate brain injury, but a million and a half emergency room visits a year in the US from 
concussions, and these are the people that go to emergency, is probably even a larger number of undiagnosed mild traumatic brain injury. And this is a group of people that we uh, started to get interested in, even though we were treating people with the severe in the, in the hospital here. This cartoon says, we've, we've given you a brain scan and we can't find anything. And this one is on the basketball uh, court. It says, I don't think it's a concussion, although the smoke has me a little concerned. <laughs> so let's get back to so the importance of axons. <clears throat> Um, there's lots of evidence now that it's not the gray matter, but axonal damage, which is a key predictor of outcome after uh, human CNS diseases in general. And specifically, probably the coma that you get after an initial, uh, inertial uh, brain injury is dependent on axon damage in the brain stem. And this is, uh, before we get into the research, this is our last sort of introductory slide. Here's uh, two images. This, they're both in their 20s. This is a normal CT for comparison. This man was in a car accident, and you can see broken skull, contusions, swelling, bad injury. He did OK. This is an MRI of a normal brain. There's the corpus callosum in here. You can see no contusions, swellings, no pressure here. But look at that corpus callosum. Completely destroyed. This 33-year-old man did nothing for seven days, and then we turned off the ventilator. He did absolutely nothing. He had no pressure issues, no contusion issues, corpus callosum, all white matter injury. So we wanted to study this in the lab, and that's why we're here today to talk about that. So a, a common model was to uh, use a pendulum to create a pressure pulse in this column of water here. And we take advantage of a pressure pulse to have it come out a column of water and drill a hole in an anesthetized rat and attach the column of water right to the surface of the brain. And in science, as you know, our big issue is to control experiments so we do the same experiment each time. Because we want to know when we treat the rat, when we treat the brain contusion, um, is it the effect of our treatment or was it a different injury? Was it a different car accident? So we can have the same car accident every time. So we have one of these devices. And what we did was we decided instead of studying what the rest of the world was studying, which is big bruises, contusions, blood, pressure, gray matter, we looked specifically at white matter. We looked at it in the hippocampus, we looked at it in the cerebellum, and we looked at it in the corpus callosum of a rat. And one of the ways we looked at it is what we, we would injure there and then slice the brain, keep the slices alive in artificial CSF, oxygen CSF, put a stimulating electrode in the left side of the brain and record in the right side of the brain stimulus artifact and then <coughs> signal from the left to the right side of the brain. And we would look at how long that signal took and how good that signal was. We could see it was injured and we would try to look at different medicine to prevent that delayed deterioration I showed you over 48 hours of those axons. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years in the lab. And we also would uh, take um, samples of that brain and stain it for a variety of things. And you can see that uh, over time, in white matter tracts, we have evidence of dead and dying axons. One of the major jobs of the axon is not is to conduct electricity, but its other job is it has a train track down the center, and it carries proteins down that train track to service that whole membrane. When the, that cytoskeleton is injured or broken or gets metabolized by those calcium activated um, enzymes, the proteins get um, congested and we can see that that axon is no longer functioning. Um, we can also see breakdown products. Uh, so we can actually stain to see the open ends, the raw ends of broken cytoskeleton. And uh, that's uh, showing up in red here. And then we can actually take that and um, um, either count it through imaging or count it through Western blotting. And what we found is that there are different populations of axons who have, that have different susceptibilities. There's different time sequences. So not all of this happens at time zero, which means it's not mechanical. Um, there's different severity of axonal injury. And so really, one of the uh, 
one of the things that has fascinated us is that if it's the same mechanical injury, why are different axons responding differently, and why is there a delay? And in that delay, is there an opportunity to interrupt that process? Uh, this is an example of where we've looked at one day and seen the breakdown products of that cytoskeleton. So we can do that with Western blotting. And many of you probably have studied Western blotting, which is really just a way of using electrophoresis to separate out proteins and say, aha, we see the specific protein and we know that's a breakdown product of that skeleton inside the axon. So now I want to talk about some real world scenarios. So uh, there are many, many examples and we only have time to talk about a few. I'm going to talk about the military scenario. So there's an estimate of two to 300,000 US servicemen or women who have had some type of mild traumatic brain injury uh, in, this, in this most recent time. It's really been dubbed, mild traumatic brain injury has, has been dubbed uh, the signature war wound of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. But on top of that, we've all heard of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and post-concussion syndrome. And we, even the CBC has done stories about our Canadian veterans who come home who've not been injured, but are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder and symptoms which are similar to post-concussion syndrome. Some of these people have report, uh, have report having had a physical head injury and a concussion, but many have not. And so the question that has arisen, why do these people have post-concussion syndromes? Why do they have post-traumatic stress disorder? Is it psychological or is it physiological? We wanted to sort of look at that question. So we wanted to think about shock waves. And here you can see the change in density of the atmosphere, which is, travels faster than the, uh, the flame or the wind that comes out of an explosive. So the shock wave or the pressure wave precedes it. And you can see here in the shadowography here, uh, when uh, shooting a pistol, you can see uh, the change in pressure. You can see it here in this photograph as well. So what's it, what is the anatomy of a blast? Uh, well, first you have the fireball. Uh, you have the shrapnel. You have a blast wind. But preceding all of that is this uh, sort of shock wave or this change in pressure. And so there are a large number of Canadian soldiers who um, obviously get injured, and they go and see uh, somebody like uh, Homer Tien, the trauma surgeon at Sunnybrook, who actually works overseas as well. And he can obviously see the guys that are injured. But there's a large group of guys who are out there when bombs have gone off, who come back, they're pumped up on adrenaline, and they say, no, I didn't get hit, and I want to go back to work, is what they say. I want to go back to work. They're all pumped up, full of venom. They want to go back to work tomorrow. And he says to me, well, how do I know? And the CDC says, well, why are so many people coming back with these disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, post infection syndrome, six months later? So we ask the question, what about subclinical primary blast injuries? And by subclinical, I mean, this is obviously a cartoon that says here, what's wrong, what's wrong, it's just my old war injury acting up. And the joke here is that it's fairly obvious what's wrong with this guy. What we hypothesize is, is it okay to be 100 meters away from a bomb going off? No scars, no injury, you feel okay. Is that okay? Did you injure your brain or not? That was the question we had. The people who were right beside the bomb, they were injured. We know that. What about the people that were 50 to 100 meters away? Does that explain anything? So we constructed our own glass device. We put the animal off to the side so it wouldn't get affected by the wind. The wind out of this glass device. We were able to generate a free lander wave, which was an overpressure and underpressure wave. Uh, we did all the physics and putting um, uh, pressure monitors three-dimensionally throughout the whole box. Blast wave energy is deposited between two different phases, solid and liquid, liquid, liquid air. Uh, so this is what a normal lung looks like. If you're close to a blast, you will injure your tympanic membrane, your lung, and your bowels. This is what an injured lung looks like when you're too close to a blast. This was the minimum energy that it took to injure the lung of a rat in our device. So we took that level and brought it down to this. 
normal lung. So this rat felt fine physically. Okay? So this is what we mean by being 100 meters away from the bomb. This is so close that you start to feel you've got an injured lung. And then um, we took them, took them, and what did we find? We found breakdown products of the white matter of, this, uh, of the axon. We found a decrease in the electrophysiologic transition of signals from the left brain to the right brain. We took uh, samples of the brain and we saw dead and dying cells in the white matter. In fact, we saw more in the periventricular white matter than we did in the cortex. Um, then we tested these animals on, um, uh, with uh, coordination and psychologically. And we found that uh, these guys who like to go mm -hmm. on a rotor rod did much less of that if they had the blast injury. Don't forget, it's a subclinical blast. They felt fine. They probably didn't even know. They were anesthetized, of course, but they, even at to day nine, they weren't able to stay on the rotor rod the same amount as the control rats. They exhibited anxiety, much more rat droppings when they went into the open field. Uh, they, did, they did explore their surroundings nearly as much as the guys who weren't blasted. Um, we put them um, in, a, uh, in a sort of a nice little dark box inside a bigger sort of cage. And this shows you how much of their head, forepaws of body they took, they came out of their cave. And so this is an index for us of anxiety and exploring your surroundings. A normal rat is a lot more than the ones who had the blast. Transitions from the dark, much less than the blast injured animals. So this was really shocking news. This was in the, this was in the Toronto Star when we published this uh, just a year ago. Because it suggests that people who've been exposed to a blast who never thought they were injured, whose lung, tympanic membrane, bowel were perfectly normal, normal, actually have measurable changes in their electrophysiology of their white matter, visible changes under the microscope, and we can see in the rats that they have psychological uh, consequences of it. Now last month, I know that Ori talked to you about preconditioning. Uh, so many of you were here. And uh, preconditioning is where you uh, take, say, a limb and say you have blood pressure cuff and so take away the blood flow to this arm. So you're making this arm ischemic, no blood flow to the arm. So stress on the arm. We all know that an arm can take that for five minutes. The protocol here is just to do that for five minutes, five times. Five minute break. No biggie. The concept is, and Reddington's a sick kid, and he has this in a review in The Lancet, that something is released from that arm, which changes the way that other organs respond to subsequent stress. And the most popular area that this is used is in the heart. Sometimes when we have to uh, blow up a balloon in the coronary arteries to treat people with blocked arteries there, that in itself is a stress to the heart, because it blocks the flow while we're blowing up that balloon. So it's a well um, uh, accepted preference now to make uh, arm ischemic and precondition the patient to tolerate ischemic, ischemia in the heart before a procedure like this. We're starting to see that the same phenomenon happens in other uh, organs of the body. So uh, there's not been a lot of success with treating traumatic brain injuries um, to date. We haven't got a drug yet that prevents the break of these axons. What we decided to do was to use a drug and see whether we could precondition animals to tolerate blast injury better. So we actually treated some animals with isoflurane for an hour, an hour before a blast, and then we compared them to control. And so this is not blasted at all, this is blasted, and this is blasted with isoflurane preconditioning. And you can see here, for example, uh, time spent in, in the lit section, the preconditioning on day nine, had a big impact on these, uh, on these animals. Also, in what's that number of squares traversed, almost the same as control here, whereas this is a blasted without preconditioning. Now, you may say, well, that's not very practical. 
and there's a, another scientist doing impractical experiments of treating someone before they get the injury. How are you meant to do that? The point for us was biologically, it meant that we've proved the principle that we can actually change the evolution of this injury. That's exciting. That's very exciting. This is the first time someone has been able to change the evolution of a white matter injury like that. So that alone is exciting. It's exciting scientifically because it means that it gives us an avenue to start exploring the, me bi uh, the biological mechanisms and the biochemistry of how we can do this. And then I suppose the long stretch is that in theory, if you're the soldier whose turn it is to get to on a sortie and sort of you know, uh, search or do their things, um, you might consider a preconditioning episode. I don't know whether, but we don't know yet. But so preconditioning is not such a, a sort of a crazy idea necessarily. I want to flip now to talking about the neurovascular unit. This is not a uh, intensive care unit. This is the unit that I was talking about before. A whole bunch of cells that we're thinking of now as a as a individually functioning unit: the endothelium, the astrocyte, the neuron, the oligodendrocyte. And we can see actually there's quite an overlap between the blood vessels in our body and the nerves in our body. So blood vessels are intimately in connection with most of our nerves. Um, and you can see here, this diagram here, that the astrocyte inside the brain really wraps itself around the basement membrane of our uh, capillaries. We did an experiment uh, where we used that sort of a plasticine thing that was at the Ontario Science Center several years ago. You know, when that German exposition came and the bodies were, oops, body works, thank you. And they, they injected plasticine through the blood vessels. We did a similar sort of thing. And what we wanted to look at was the blood vessels inside the cortex and the white matter of a rat brain. And then with a, two atmospheres, just the intensity of that um, injury that I showed you before. What, what happens after a brain injury to the blood vessels? You can see here the uh, diameters of the blood vessels deteriorate, and you can just see visually deterioration of the blood vessels primarily. Um, if we stain for endothelium, we can see uh, after that fluid percussion injury, much fewer vessels, the diameter's gone down, the length has gone down, the count has gone down. We have some partners that we're working with in China who also made a very interesting observation, and this is in human. And they looked at endothelial progenitor cells, which is in the hierarchy towards stem cells. These are cells which are meant to turn into endothelial cells. So they're not stem cells, but they're not quite endothelial cells yet. So in our blood, we have these endothelial progenitor cells circulating. And when they land somewhere, they will turn into an endothelial cell, usually. It turns out what they noticed was that um, people who had more endothelial, circulating endothelial cells did much better after a brain injury. Well, this really caught our interest, which is why we contacted them, because we thought, well, we've discovered that uh, the endothelial cells may be the vulnerable cells in the brain. And maybe when you bang your head, it's the capillaries which deteriorate. So that was one of our hypotheses that we wanted to sort of uh, uh, look at. But with this in mind, we, start, we said to ourselves, well, maybe we need to replace what has been lost by these, uh, by these disappearing capillaries and endothelial cells. So we asked the following questions. Can circulating endothelial progenitor cells break the brain's trauma? This is a suggestion from these humans in China. Do they physically contribute to the formation of new capillaries to improve microcirculation? Or is their importance related to the sort of trophic factors or other factors that they may secrete? Are they actually forming new blood vessels again? Or are they just good cells that secrete good, um, uh, good chemicals around them? This cartoon says, look, stem cells. And this snowman, snowwoman is looking at snowflakes. So what we did was we isolated uh, uh, bone, uh, from the bone marrow uh, stem cells. We cultured them outside the body. 
uh, we separate out their, the, the sort of fluid that was around these cultured stem cells and um, isolated the uh, stem cells themselves. And after injuring the white matter of uh, a rat brain, we either injected them with um, just the isolated stem cells or the media. We stained these stem cells uh, beforehand and we were able to determine uh, that they, they had a certain protein on the surface so we could sort of see them. We gave them this compound here, here which they readily take up to prove that, that, that endothelial cells normally take up. So we demonstrated that these endothelial progenitor cells were behaving like endothelial cells because they took up this CCLDL. <coughs> Uh, we were able to sort of give them a stain so that when we injected them, we could find them again. And then when we put them into the, um, the injured rats, we could actually see them in amongst all the other neurons. We saw them five days after a head injury, which was fascinating to us because for some reason, these, uh, these endothelial gender cells honed in on the injury site of the injured brain. So there's lots to study there in terms of what is that homing mechanism? Why have these, why is this a response in these humans that they observed in China? And what is happening in our rats that these endothelial progenitor cells are going to the area of injured brain? Um, well, before we answered all those mechanistic questions, what we've done so far is to look, well, what impact has it had? So this is a sham injured. So this is normal amount of cells, normal amount of capillaries. This is what happens after injury. You've already seen that. Decreased capillaries. This is after we've uh, given the rats endothelial progenitor cells. And you can see here a lot more blood vessels than there are in this middle photograph here. We're able to measure that using specific uh, uh, measures, total length of capillaries. So with the endothelial progenitor cells, we have almost a normal length of capillaries returned compared to the injured animals alone. So this is a major, major advance for us in the lab, that we were able to take these endothelial progenitor cells, inject them in rats, and replenish the blood vessels which are lost. We're looking at that um, APP. I told you about uh, one of the functions of the axon was to tr uh, transmit uh, proteins, like uh, amyloid precursor protein, down the train tracks. And so this is what, what normal brain looks like, no traffic jam. When you injure axons, big traffic jams. Proteins get all congested, they don't get uh, transmitted down the train tracks. And you can see here that when we add, all we did was add individual progenitor cells, not as much of a traffic jam. We think we're preserving uh, uh, axonal function. And we can actually uh, measure that in terms of the number of APP swellings. So finally, I'll just finish up here. Uh, we uh, wanted to look um, in vitro at the evaluation of these cells. We chose two paradigms. We chose a, one where we cultured individual neurons, and we used this sort of suction device to put some individual neurons on a membrane, put a suction cup there, and it deforms a membrane. And by doing the right calculation, we can say we have we stretched at 5 or 10 or 15%. I, showed you, I told you about that before. So we can decide how much we're stretching the axon. And that's a traumatic stress to the axon. But I've also told you that swelling and blood flow is very important in the brain. I told you that at the beginning. So we, with the same in vitro cultured axons, not in the body now, but in a Petri dish, we took away the oxygen glucose, called oxygen glucose deprivation. And that sort of models no blood flow. Mostly what your blood does for you is is bring oxygen <coughs> glucose. So we sort of wanted to sort out how were these endothelial progenitor cells helping these axons? Were they helping them from their stretch or were they helping them from their oxygen glucose deprivation? So we did the mechanical trauma. We did the stretch injury. You see these blebs. We gave them the conditioned media. They still have the blebs. We did uh, the same thing again, but this time, instead of stretching them, we gave them this oxygen glucose uh, deprivation. We gave them the EPCs. And when we looked, um, the oxygen uh, glucose deprivation with the conditioned media helped them, but not the stem cells alone. 
not the EPCs alone. So what are our conclusions from this? The way the endothelial progenitor cells help is probably with the physiologic things, like oxygen glucose separation, and not with the mechanical stretch. And the way they do it is through what they're secreting in their media, as opposed to the cells doing something directly themselves. Do you understand the logic there? That's how we design that experiment. So I'm going to end there to say that what we're really interested in is um, figuring out why it is that when you stretch an axon, it breaks 48 hours later. And why it is that certain people who have a concussion, 10% of them will have post-concussion syndromes a year later. And so what it is that happens in that 48 hours or those days and months afterwards which causes the deterioration of white matter. We're excited about white matter because we think that's where the connection is, the connections are that are create intelligence, awareness, and consciousness between all the parts of your gray matter. And so that's what we're working on in the lab. Um, this is our lab here, Eugene Park, Elaine Liu, Kathy Park. We have collaborators here at the University of Toronto and in China. I managed to get this special uh, uh, CT scan, although I know it violates privacy, but uh, this is his uh, CT scan. And that's my email if you want to email me with any questions or comments. Thank you for your attention. I think we have uh, three or four minutes for questions. Yes, sir. Does a stroke fit anywhere in any of this? Yeah. So at the, at the very um, beginning, I divided injuries into these groups. And today, I was going to talk about traumatic injuries. And uh, so trauma, um, the way we divide things is you know, trauma is when we transfer energy. And so all of these, uh, most of what I talked to you about today was, was from uh, transfer of energy, like a shockwave and so on. However, what I did also tell you is that uh, one of the big things that happens with trauma is the brain swells up and cuts off its own blood supply, which leads to inadequate blood flow, which is what happens in a stroke. So the two main ways you have a stroke is when some sort of, some sort of breaks off from a, from a brain and goes up and plugs a blood vessel, and everything downstream of that blood vessel doesn't get any blood supply. I've had three mini strokes. Is that right? And they all started with my feet. Down, yes. Then working their way up, and I didn't know what was going to I couldn't talk. Right. And that was called a mini stroke. Right. So those mini strokes are very important to assign, and as you all know, they're uh, those are a perfect example of the signs of stroke. And we now think of stroke very differently than we did even 10 years ago. You know, we. We all sort of learn that somebody goes like this and collapses, we're going to do CPR, we're going to call 911. Now, with, if that gentleman were in your living room, what you would do would be to call 911 because that is urgent. Because if that didn't uh, reverse, because the mini strokes reverse, if that didn't reverse, you need to get to the hospital within minutes to hours to be eligible to pull clot busting drugs so sort of prevent that from becoming permanent. But what's actually happening? What, what is happening is that there are blood vessels that go to the surface of the brain, the gray matter of the brain, and one of them gets plugged with a little blood clot. And, um, and then, as I told you at the very beginning, the brain is very vulnerable. It's time constant. It, it depends on oxygen and glucose continuously. It's a very high metabolic rate. So in five, five ten seconds of no blood flow to the whole brain, you become unconscious. But if it's just one little spot, in five to ten seconds of a blood clot blocking that blood vessel, those neurons will stop firing. So if this neuron here stops firing, you feel numb here or here. And so fortunately, sometimes those blood clots break up on their own because they're very small. Sometimes we have other blood vessels which come in and supply the same neuron. So we have redundant blood supply, if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, the clot is too big, there's no alternative blood supply, and it's too big to break up on its own. And that's called a stroke. 
So a mini-stroke is something which we define as something which reverses its disease symptomatically, blood clot breaks up, within 24 hours. But it's an important sign, and so, and you don't know at the beginning what the end of the story is going to look like. So you get yourself to hospital in a 911 the way, no matter what. It just seemed weird to me that it started in my toes, and that it all had to do with my brain. Exactly. Well, because I, well, I mean, I showed you that picture of the... I don't need um, to tie you up here. And that's okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So I know, for example, the spinal cord injury guys are ahead of us, and they are already delivering them directly. I think one of the things that's fascinating in our lab is that when we put these into the tail vein of our we uh, there are certain homing <coughs> mechanisms that these cells end up in injury sites, and certainly even native uh, progenitor cells end up at injury sites. So we would like to understand what cell surface markers there are to maybe use a biological of getting these things to their target um, as probably going to be the best bet as opposed to you know sticking a needle in the injury right so that's that's the um, that's the goal is to use a biological targeting mechanism yes um, going back to your subclinical blast right? yes I'm wondering do you think there's a possibility that um, people would be misdiagnosed with PTSD when really they're suffering from PCS because of the overlap of symptoms? Right. So I don't want to create an issue where there isn't one. And um, it gets very semantic and philosophical because I think of PTSD and even PCS as a syndrome. And I think of a syndrome as really a collection or a constellation of signs and symptoms. And by definition, you've got it. If you've got that syndrome, all you have to do is fulfill the requirements of having that. The question is not whether they're being misdiagnosed, but what is the significance of the diagnosis? Yeah. So if you've got the syndrome, what's underlying it? And so, and there are lots of biological things which cause psychological symptoms that are amenable to, say, talk therapy or psychotherapy or, or psychopharmacotherapy, right? So I'm not, so we don't, so that's not, a, that's not the issue. The point that I was trying to highlight by this is that, that there are biological um, uh, determinants of this syndrome in a, maybe a good number of cases. And that gives us optimism for the possibility of using you know, either preventive biological therapy or early biological pharmacotherapy. And we don't just throw up our hands in the air and say, okay, well, PTSD strictly in the domain of a functional sort of disorder or syndrome as opposed to one which may be amenable to um, uh, sort of therapy aimed at its cause. Because we certainly use pharmacotherapy aimed at symptoms all the time, all the time right? But I, I'm interested in pharmacotherapy aimed at its cause. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. If someone is for a concussion, today is it as fake to make one of the symptoms? Is what? Right. So the thing is about neurologic symptoms in general is that there's lots of overlap, meaning that fainting could be a sign of a number of things. And um, so fainting isn't a classic one for post-concussion syndrome, although feeling dizzy is, having vertigo is, and uh, sometimes that leads to people sort of having the sensation that they're going to fall over. And some people might call that fainting. But fainting, um, the technical word we use for fainting is syncope and presyncope, which is where uh, we sort of think of, uh, and, and other people use fainting in a broader sense. But I tend to use fainting in a very specific sense, which is when you're not enough blood flow to your brain, your retina blood flow decreases so you see the world narrow down in terms of field and you feel like you're going to go down because your, your level of consciousness is decreasing. And that's typically not enough blood flow. 
And so it can be dangerous because if you f you're doing the wrong thing, like driving, it can be very dangerous. <coughs> if you faint when you're on a ladder, it can be very dangerous. So we take fainting very seriously. And so even though it's overlapping with other things which are chronic, like post-concussion syndrome, you know, we have to look at the most dangerous causes of fainting first. Which are? The most dangerous causes of fainting are sort of having a heart rhythm disorder, having too low blood, low blood. So you've got to rule those things out first if, if one is prone to fainting. And then if you rule those things out, then we can talk about the less dangerous things. But you have to look at the dangerous things first. So, I mean, there are two ways that doctors think, right? If you're in a family doctor's office, you think, what's the most common? If you're in an emergency room, you say, what's the most dangerous? Because that happened to my daughter last week. Yes, she fainted. She hit her head first. And then she fainted. A week later. A week later. So, I mean, she needs to see a doctor. She has. Yeah. But they don't know what's wrong with her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm here, to find out. <laughs> Um, so just in your last slide, you were talking about how you used the, um, the uh, progenitor cells and it didn't actually, actually add in glucose and oxygen. Um, it didn't work as well, but when you gave the progenitor cells with the, the medium, medium that it actually worked, yes. did you try a condition where you just gave the medium and not the progenitor cells to see if the cells that were already there, like the epithelial cells, could use the medium and administer the oxygen or glucose? I don't know. If we've done that, the, Eugene, if we've done that? Just, just the media alone without the progenitor cells. That's what the condition no, I know, but, but in this experiment, we had the progenitor cells as well. Uh, as, as a separate arm, so the right. cells and cells in the condition media, yeah. Yeah. and the cells and cells didn't have an effect on the condition media. So yes mm -hmm. is the answer. So, okay, so that yeah. last condition was just yeah. the medium with the progenitor cells? Yeah. Okay. Uh, just one second. You said you showed that the person Yes. Well, that's a great question. You know, that's fascinating, really, because, um, uh, you know, this is why I tried to, uh, you know, funny story, I was so frustrated this morning because uh, I actually wrote a chapter in a book, and somebody's borrowed my book, and I don't have my slides anymore, <laughs> and I was so frustrated, and then I tried to buy it for my own chapter for $22, and it wouldn't let me, so this was a sample, and that's why, and, the, and this was a sample, this is the resolution I get, it's my own bloody picture. <laughs> I was so frustrated, you know. And um, the point here is that uh, a lot of the architecture of the brain will stay intact, except, and so if you think of the physics, when you've got centrifugal force, you're stretching long things. Uh, everything else is all tightly packed in, like, uh, you know, like a bag of rice sort of thing. And so that's all fine, but it's the long wires in between that you're going to get injured. And that's what's so fascinating about this is that you know you rotate your head quickly and then there's the shear phenomenon too. So that's why these axons are more vulnerable. But your question is really good because we've even within one bundle of axons find that some axons are more vulnerable than the others. So we're, we've got so many detective clues going, we don't even have enough hours in the day because we think, well, there's a clue there. There's gotta be a clue because um, it's not all mechanical. There's something biological there. And so that's what we're pursuing. We need more people in the lab. More, more, we've got more ideas than there are hours in a day. There's only 28. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, so there's a whole group, there's a whole literature, you know, and um, around the sort of mechanics and physics of what happens in axons when they are either stretched, twisted, and all these things. And so one theory is, and what I didn't show you here, was that there are actually holes that open up in the uh, lipid bilayer membrane. And you can actually demonstrate the size of the hole by putting in these inert molecules that are of different size and sort of see them get into the cell and or um, 
and, and so you can, so we, we know that there are holes that open up. And of course, that's a huge because we spend all this time worrying about um, ion pores and ion channels and what opens them. And then a great big, you know, hole in some of these that allows in large molecules. Um, but in terms of, you know, I, I don't, there are macroscopic questions around what's the difference between rotating and accelerating and, and what you're talking about. I don't know at the cellular level whether people have looked at the protein transport significance of the different biomechanics. Can I just the, um, of the differences between maybe something, uh, a hot <coughs> Right. Well, that's one of the things that's fascinating us too. And so we're, we're actually wondering whether BLAST is a good model of concussion. Because if it is, um, well, it'd be fascinating from an experimental perspective because then it's easier to study uh, because we can produce a BLAST ease, uh, more easily. We're wondering about the final common mechanisms and so whether the same drug, we'd like to, we'd like to discover a drug that you swallow as soon as you've had a concussion after playing hockey, you know? And so and we'd like to do that for the people exposed to blast as well. And so um, we'd like to know the differences. And that's partly why we're studying that, be because we're trying to describe the physiology. In fact, that's, that's very much what we're doing, is we're sort of, we've got the two models, the concussion, the hit, and the blast. And we're <coughs> sort of answering the compare and contrast question. <laughs> Anything else? Can I ask just one question? Yeah. Has the brain changed over the centuries? <coughs> well, I think, um, I think uh, it's a fascinating uh, question to look at sort of, um, you know, the study of different species and what and how the brains are different and, in, and for what reason. and. Um, and sort of, if you, if you look over, uh, over time, what has happened to the frontal lobes uh, and the size of the frontal lobes and so on. Um, so I don't think I would say centuries, but I, I think, you know, millions of years, right? Okay. So not, but well, nothing has happened over the last centuries that I know of. Supposing when you ask that, everybody in this room is probably from some different part of the world, okay? Yes, yeah. Do you see things that show up in, in your work because of that? Um, there are slight <coughs> differences, and, um, you know, there's gender differences, and um, there's skull thickness differences, in, and, um, but nothing that I know of in a functional sense okay. or in a vulnerability sense. I mean, uh, females might, might be better than males if from a head injury, and there are human trials now with the impact of progesterone, uh, which may actually be a, 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 a neuronally protective uh, drug, or whatever you call it, hormone. And um, so, um, so there are humans with head injury getting progesterone today in various places in, in the world. Yep. Sorry, I just wanted to ask because you just <laughs> mentioned that like women generally speaking do better for something like a TBI. Mm -hmm. um, but like for example, with strokes, like specifically with subarachnoid hemorrhage strokes, you see the opposite. The women do much worse. So I was wondering just yeah. if there was a reason. I mean, why. don't over interpret what I'm saying. I'm a half of me has got my foot in blood and guts, and the other half is in studying science in the, in the very subtle ways. And so, in the blood and guts sort of way. Uh, you know, we uh, women are smaller, have smaller blood vessels. If they, you know, so there's lots of reasons for a whole variety of reasons that, that things may not be as good if you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, you know, to have progesterone, you have to be premenopausal and so on. So, you know, it depends when you're having a stroke. So, most people who have strokes are postmenopausal. Most women have strokes are postmenopausal. Men, too, probably post. What's it called? Andropause. And um, so, um, so, but what I'm sort of talking about is sort of at the sort of leading edge of the subtleties of, of a very controlled experimental situation, saying progesterone is probably better in a controlled setting. But there's, so there's still two different you know, going on. Sorry, I have one last question. Yeah. It might be difficult to explain this to a 
referring to desire and disturbance is anticipation of like an impact. Does that, you know, for example, if you're in a sport, you know you will have that impact. Whereas if you go over like a giant pothole, I mean, like, you know, and you fall. Yeah, well, you know, it's something, it's funny because, um, one of the little uh, secrets in the, in the world, in my butt and guts world, is that um, the people that abuse alcohol excessively, for some reason, survive really well. I mean, they have like the nine lives like a cat. And it's just unbelievable that the, the most incredible things will happen. And we're starting to wonder whether um, what you're saying may actually be the opposite. That, that it could be that um, it could be that if you are really relaxed under the influence of a large amount of alcohol, you roll with the punch sort of thing, and um, and we don't understand physics that well because if you brace yourself to take a hit, the physics of it are is you've actually got to sort of give as much back. I'm not explaining this well. You guys know better. Who's in a uniform? You would understand the physics of this better than me. But you know if you if you get hit, the better things. Will Roll with it, right? But if you sort of have to bounce it back, you've got to give as much force back as you got, right? Isn't that right in physics? And so, and uh, so anyway, so we find that alcohol and relaxed people do better. I'm not recommending it. <laughs> I am recommending rolling with punches. You know, some of you older guys know we probably we had more experience. No, no. <laughs> I'm in marketing. <laughs> Some of the younger guys know. But I think if you take a karate hit, you're meant to work with it rather than oppose it. Isn't that right? Who does karate? You do karate. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. You do karate. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Good very